Good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, January's edition of Decoding Digital. Uh, I'm Leon Cavley. I'm the founder and director here at Door 4. Uh, and this is the very first Decoding Digital webinar event of 2022, a wealth of experience. Uh, Door 4 are a Northwest-based performance marketing agency. We work with clients uh, with our reach, convert, and scale philosophy across paid and organic media, UX, uh, and web development underpinning strategic optimization. So I'm delighted to uh, have you all here on Zoom, on LinkedIn, on YouTube, on Facebook, and on Twitter, uh, hopefully all the way across the world, uh, for a wealth of experience with two guest speakers today. Uh, unfortunately, our own Conrad has had to uh, drop out uh, due to commercial reasons. Uh, um, and our speakers today have got loads of skill and passion around customer experience, user experience, and I'm going to introduce them to you uh, right now. Um, today, we have Kevin Robinson, Senior Conversion Analyst at Brain Labs. Kevin works with numerous household brands uh, using research and insights, turning them into uh, delightful customer experiences. Uh, and we've got Chloe Sinclair, who is Head of Retail, Travel, Hospitality and Logistics at UserZoom. Uh, with several years of experience in digital transformation, Chloe is very, very familiar with delivering superb customer success for many, many clients, for hundreds of clients. Both have got experience treading the Decoding Digital boards. Uh, so we know that they'll both be excellent speakers for you today uh, for today's webinar. So a quick note about today's running order. Um, we'll be online for probably uh, 50 to 60 minutes this morning, and then you can get right back to your busy day. Um, each speaker will be 20 to 25 minutes. Um, and after the second speaker, we're gonna open up the Q&A. So, those of you that are in Zoom, there's a Q&A feature. Uh, those of you who are on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube. Uh, sadly, we're not on TikTok this time, maybe next time. Um, feel free to throw comments and questions into uh, the various chat and comments features and our superb team will scoop them up and we can post them to our speakers. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce this morning's first speaker, Kevin Robinson. I'm going to ask Kevin to uh, come into camera. Hello. Hello, Kevin. Great to have you here. Thanks for joining us. No worries. It's good to be here. Fantastic. You're looking very, very green there behind you. I hope those plants are being watered. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> Fantastic. Kevin, I'm just going to hand straight over to you uh, to our speak to our guest this morning. So uh, over to you and I'll speak to you later for Q&A. Fantastic. Let me uh, share my screen. Hopefully you can see that. Uh, looking good. Hello, I'm Kevin Robinson. Well, I'm not Kevin Robinson. I think that's your job to be Kevin <laughs> Robinson. That's all up. You sound great. I'm going to zoom out. I'll speak to you later, Kevin. Fantastic. Great. Thanks, Leon. So, yeah, I'm Kevin Robinson, Senior Conversion Analyst here at Brain Labs. We're an experimentation-focused digital agency. Um, I work in our Manchester office, but we're based um, all over the world. And we work with lots of exciting brands you've probably heard of. Uh, my number, my job is all about numbers, so essentially sitting in front of a spreadsheet all day um, and making good things happen from that. Uh, in a bit more detail, I'll take what users do on a website, turn that into analytics data, um, turn that data into really interesting stories and insights that can then be passed on to a uh, designer to optimise the website and, and improve user journeys and ultimately improve business performance. So why am I here today? And more importantly, why are you sit, sat there um, taking your time away from your Friday morning to listen to me? Um, I think the, the crux of my kind of 10, 15 minutes here is, is about, is your, is your website data destined for the boardroom or the designer's pad? Or slightly more poetically, is your, are you using your data to, to prove performance or improve it? Um, so what does that actually mean? Um, I think in terms of how we can take use data to actually create performance rather than just talk about performance, I see there's three different um, different strands to this. We've got focusing on users, not just audiences. We've got actually enriching your analytics with um, additional data. And we've got actually making your life easier. There's lots of things we can do just to, just to make your life easier. So I'm going to jump into the first one of those, which is focusing on users, not just audiences. So most of the time when we talk about reporting, we are talking about audiences, whether it's um, everyone, all the sessions on our website, whether it's leads generated through the website, spend on our different ad platforms, 
we might take that down to device level or channel level or even campaign level, but it's generally grouping all people together, depending on, on where they've come from or, or what audience they're, they're a part of. Instead, what we can really do to, to really understand how we can optimize the website is understand actually users as individuals, because everybody, every single person on your site is interacting with the, with the site in a very different way. So for example, if Greta Thunberg and David Beckham are both on your site, they both complete a transaction. Do they have the same motivations? Are they finding the same product in, in the same way? Are they behaving exactly the same? Can we treat them the same? Probably not. And similarly, if Taylor Swift and, and Sir Trevor McDonald are both on your website, they're both abandoned at the basket. Again, did they abandon for the same reason? Did they have the same problems? Did they come into the site with the same expectations and, and motivations? Can we treat them the same? Again, probably not. So we should start to look at individuals using our site as individuals in order to understand how we can uh, optimize that experience a little bit more. So this is a, a, an example I've worked on really recently, just in the last few weeks actually, on, on Ernest Jones, uh, the jeweler, one of my clients here at Brain Labs. And we want to understand um, how loyal users were to certain attributes on the site, so whether people were shopping around really widely or if they were coming to a site with a very set vision of exactly what they wanted. So we looked at for each individual user, we looked at all their individual interactions through looking at product pages, product listing pages, uh, interacting with the navigation and, and filters and everything else. And from that, we logged a few different things. We logged um, like the, the category, um, the price range, the um, whether it's on sale, different product attributes, uh, and lots of things like that. And what we found from back of that was that actually, yeah, users do come to a site with a really clear vision of what they want. So almost everybody is only interacting with a single product type. So you can see user one here, only ever looking at watches. Everything they do is watches. User two, everything they do is, is jewelry, and in particular necklaces. Uh, user three is a little bit more um, flipping between two. But the majority of users uh, fall into brackets one and two. And we see the same with price range. People come with a really specific price range. And even product attributes, um, users and, and brands, we found the users are really sticking to that one um, sort of one single product type and, and really um, narrow attributes within that. So if we know that users, if we know that user one here is only ever interested in watches, um, it makes no sense to us to distract them with anything else. So a few things we were able to do from the back of this was um, personalize the homepage. So if we know that users are only ever interested, only ever interested in watches, let's just show them watches. We don't need to show them uh, rings and jewelry and all this other stuff. Just show them watches because that's all they care about. Uh, similarly with the navigation, again, if we know someone's interested in watches, then when we go into navigation, we'll show them uh, some quick links within watches um, just to help that speed up our user journey and promote some of those little bits uh, a little bit more. So using the data we've got on those individuals to really personalize the site and help improve their, their, their user journey and ultimately push them further towards conversion for the client. Uh, another example of that is, is a brew dog. So they charge shipping um, based on the box. They, they did ship charge shipping based on the basket size. So essentially, when you added a certain number of, of cans or bottles, essentially the delivery cost doubled. Um, so we measured the, the, the basket size when people coming into a basket. We measured how people were interacting with different elements within the basket and also then the eventual order size uh, at the end of that. And what we found is that 42% of users were actually re removing products at this point in order to reduce shipping costs. So um, essentially what we're doing is when people are trying to buy more products, we're almost punishing them for spending more of us, which obviously doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, so using all, all this data, we were, we were able to uh, make a case for actually removing that incremental pricing and just having a flat, uh, a flat shipping fee. Uh, that led to a big reduction in users moving products to the basket, um, increased transactions by like 8-9% uh, with little little imp impact to margin uh, little impact to margin so it's really good um business performance at the end of that and actually brew dogs now done a full 180 and is actually incentivizing up in the order side so instead of doubling your um shipping costs we're actually incentivizing uh, that with with free delivery so a really good example of how we can take that one little bit of data of where people are drop dropping off and make a massive impact to that user journey and the revenue at the end of it so the next kind of strand of this one to look at is enriching your website an analytics. So 
Context is so important. So what users do on your site only tells half the story. There's so many different attributes in, that can influence what they do. So whether that's weather conditions, whether it's local store stock, whether that's previous engagement, whether that's location, whether it's COVID status. Um, and then similarly, after they've uh, a user's been in your site, what happens when they come back? What happens um, after the lead's been made? What happens after the sale's been made? There's so many different data sources that can actually come in and make us tell a, a much richer story. So here's an example of buying action. Um, this is a session on a website. Someone comes from Google and makes an inquiry. Fantastic. We've got a conversion from our SEO traffic. Brilliant news, everyone. However, if we step back a little bit, we can see that they actually discovered us, first of all, from PPC, uh, from a Google ad. Um, and then a few weeks later, some of our social posts helped to build that relationship a little bit more. So what was initially looked like an organic search result is starting to get a little bit less clear. Um, but then when we look actually after the conversion, we start to look at our in our CRM and look at how that, that, that user um, followed up. We were to qualify that lead. Uh, a week later, we followed up successfully. Over a few days after that, that lead was abandoned. They said they were no longer interested. And ultimately, that was it. The lead was over. So although we were patting our backs and, uh, for getting an inquiry in the middle, actually that ended up just not giving us any revenue at all. So whereas generally we might generally just look at this session data, um, instead what we can really do is start to enrich that, that session data with other data sources, whether that's user data um, on the left hand side and, and ad platform data so we can start to get the spend that's involved, et cetera. Um, oh, and, and then after the fact, put, start pulling that, that CRM data so we can actually um, tab, tab revenue back to that. So this whole process really allows us to understand that user behavior a lot more rather than just what's happening at one point. Actually, what's the whole journey of that user from discovering us right through to the, the final contact uh, allows us to measure the impact of different channels at different points in the journey, uh, enables better lead attribution between channels. So we're not just saying this is just an organic search because actually we put Google ad spend into this, which has is, is, is helped that, that, that inquiry come about. Um, and again, um, revenue attribution so did this lead actually end up giving his revenue or not so it really helps us to by pulling those three lots of few different data sources together um, we can really understand that that journey in, in a lot more detail a, another really interesting way of um, integrating different data sources together uh, this is a piece of work that my one of my colleagues joe did uh, recently and this is in, in integrating weather data with our google analytics so a, we're able to use a, an API which connects um, weather data into, into analytics. And essentially, whenever somebody lands on the site, we log those weather conditions, whether it's cloudy, the temperature, whether it's raining, um, et cetera. And we found some really interesting stuff back of that. So we saw that um, as the temperature got warmer, average order value um, increased um, really clearly, um, but also kind of different engagements um, based, so things like when it was raining, we had low conversion rate, but a really high um, number of people looking for support. Uh, when it's sunny, conversion rate was average, but support requests were really low. So we can we learned quite you know really quickly that actually the weather conditions outside do impact how users interact with our website, and we can probably optimize our experience to take advantage of that. So how do we do that? Well, first of all. It can really impact that acquisition strategy. If we know that uh, if it's raining, people are less likely to uh, to convert, then we can take a little bit of ad spend away from that. Similarly, if it's sunny and it's warm, we know people are going to convert more and they're going to spend more. So let's put more of our ad spend into these um, sunnier, warmer warmer periods. Um, and it can also impact our, our, our website ex experience as well. So if it's rainy, maybe on the website homepage, we're pushing support or maybe we're offering that reassurance messaging um, whereas when it's sunny and warm, let's really make sure the website is pushing for higher now. Don't consider just higher now and maybe even extend by a few days if the, the weather is forecast to be um, really nice weather for, for, for a week or so. So we can really use that weather data then to, to optimize that, that web experience and um, yeah, ultimately improve business performance. And the final bit here is about making your life easier because you spend too much time reporting. Um, everybody does. Every business, every organization I've ever worked at or with um, always feels like they spend too much time um, doing manual work around, around reporting. Uh, a really good example of that is one of the clients I work with uh, receives 3,000 feedback comments through their website every month. 
it's obviously impossible to kind of for someone to read through that and make sense of it and pick out the trends and what's important what's changing from month to month but that's what we had to do previously someone was having to read through all these feedback comments uh, individually so what we've done instead is we've built a, an automated process that pulls that data into a data studio dashboard um, it picks out the most used words um, and then how our frequency has changed so that really helps us to, uh, to identify trends really quickly so an example of that in action is you can see here that the word basket is the second most used word in this period and it's um it's it's the usage of the word basket has increased by 47 percent um month on month so straight away we can look at that and really really quickly see okay there's probably something gone wrong with the basket um it doesn't replace human inter interpretation someone's still going to then go in and look at the individual comments that are to do with the basket and, and find out what's going wrong but what it does it makes it much more efficient so instead of someone spending days and weeks having to read through read through his comments and generally getting the idea there's maybe something wrong with the basket straight away in like five seconds you can look at this and say we need to investigate the basket straight away it's made everyone's life um easier quicker and we can spend more time actually taking action rather than just reading the feedback um i'm a big believer if someone's not something isn't adding value then automate it um I think we all spend far too much time manually input, inputting things into spreadsheets, doing calculations, moving things from one place to another. Um, I, I, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to spend so much time doing it. So a really big thing uh, I'm supporting of is, is data automation. So how can we move things around? How can we get essentially internet magic to move data around for us? So there are services such as things like Funnel and Stitch and a few others that can do this. So we can take data from analytics google ads facebook google sheets salesforce for us hubspot whatever it is uh, and move it somewhere else and do um kind of merge it together and, and move somewhere else so like put it into google sheets for a report for your boss put it into data studio for um a dashboard put it into google bigquery or ftp uh, for some other reason so you can essentially make all these data channels all these data the stuff that you usually do manually we can get the internet to do that, do that for us essentially so here's a really good example i've seen that uh, in action recently so there's a business that takes a, a google sheet of all their forecast and budget data get takes their google analytics data their google ad spend their facebook ad spend and also their lead progression data from after the fact um, puts that into one of these services um, service merge all, merges all that together and spits out a essentially a boardroom ready report um, with overall spend and ROI of all these all these ad platforms together, um, the long term value from lead progression. So all these tasks that we might generally do manually every day or every week, it takes a lot of time and um, is just not directly adding value. Um, we can get essentially the internet, um, some of these services uh, to do that for us, uh, and just free up a lot of time, free up more time. Again, exactly the same for us to spend more time taking action rather than just learning what learning what's happening so how do we make that happen i know it probably sounds scary there's lots 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 involved there um but it's not uh, i promise um it's really just about being inquisitive it's really just about asking why as much as you can so if we talk about take that brood of example we can say okay conversion rate is quite low why is that okay we can, we can see that the it's probably because the checkout completion rate is really low okay well, why is that let's have a look at different price brackets weirdly it's only for users with large baskets okay that's weird why what what are people what are those users doing in the basket okay they're removing items to get to the delivery threshold okay why are they doing that it's probably because they're being charged double delivery um what if what if we change that what if we remove that tier delivery will that affect our bottom line let's test it so if you if you see something that's weird on, on the data or something that doesn't look great if we ask why enough times we'll essentially get eventually get to a hypothesis that we can test uh, and see what happens um if there's three things you can do today one would be check your analytics funnel tracking so that if you're an e-com site that's making sure you've got um pdps um, plps you've got add to baskets you've got checkouts you've got transactions all those tra uh, tracked properly if you're lead generation it's making sure you've got um, kind of call to action buttons tracked people coming into form tracked uh, different form fields tracked so you can see where people are falling off um, and ideally those um, like lead progression after a fact as well um, step two just look at these rates and see what looks wrong you see if anything looks raw looks really low see if it's something changing all the time either going up or going down and ask why just ask why as many times 
as you can. Um, and hopefully that will give you some insightful opportunities and data. And that is the end of me. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Kevin. That was a fantastic presentation. And I'm just wondering, was that was that actually, is it a kind of brew dog there? Were you actually uh, supporting your client's products there? <laughs> um, maybe a little bit early for that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. It comes out of much time. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll be joining you in about an hour for that, yeah. Um, <laughs> thanks very much. I really appreciate your time uh, this morning, Kevin. Thanks for a great talk. I hope you're going to stick around for uh, the Q&A uh, in about 20, 25 minutes. Um, a reminder to our guests our, um, that are joining us today, do drop any questions that you've got into, uh, into the comments, into chat for, for Kevin. I'm sure he'll be delighted to answer them. I'm going to invite uh, Chloe Sinclair to come in and join us now. Chloe Sinclair is uh, Head of Travel, Transport, Hospitality and Logistics at Uzoom. Good morning to you, Chloe. Hi, good morning, Leon. How are you? I'm really, really good. Thank you. All the better seeing you uh, this morning. Um, great to have you here. Thanks for giving up your time to speak to uh, our guest this morning. I'm sure you're excited about hearing from you. I'm going to hand over to you um, without any further delay. Perfect. Well, thanks very much for having me. I think the last time I was on the Decoding Digital um, talk was just before, probably seven days before the UK realised that COVID was actually a thing. Um, and you wisely, Leon, decided that we should cancel the Decoding Digital event and go online instead, which was a great idea in retrospect. However, <clears throat> I had bought 40 goodie bags worth of swag with me from the office the day before, which are still in my cupboard um, from floor to ceiling. So if anyone would like any swag, please do um, drop it in the chat because honestly, I'm quite sick of looking at it. I've got teddies and pens to last me a lifetime and even my dog doesn't want them anymore. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, absolutely great to be here. So today I'm going to be talking about the importance of UX, which um, Kevin has already given us a, a really good overview into. Thank you, Kevin. And I also learned a couple of things in there as well, which was fantastic. I think the big question being, let's always keep asking the why, and hopefully that will become more transparent through um, this presentation as well. So who am I? So Leon has already given me a short introduction. So I'm Chloe Sinclair, Head of Retail, Travel, Transport, Hospitality, Logistics and Postal at UserZoom. However, that's an absolute mouthful. So I've shortened it to Retail and Travel at UserZoom. My background um, or the core of my background has been within customer journeys and best practice. And in recent history, I have moved over to a company called UserZoom, where I now am, and I'm representing today, um, to really look at um, testing what actually makes the best practice and how do we tweak the customer journey for it to be the best as possible. And as Kevin said, every customer's journey might be different, so it's really important that we understand our persona. So I'm quite excited to kind of be taking a peek behind the curtain and seeing really what does make UX tick. Um, so before we start, um, it's probably best just to give a, a quick introduction to what is UX. Um, so, of course, we know it's user experience. And for all of you purists in the room, um, please don't judge me because this is probably not a comprehensive version of what UX is. But for the sake of today, hopefully it'll do. So according to a study from Oxford Journal, Interacting with Computers, which sounds an interesting journal, um, the goal of UX design in business is to improve customer satisfaction and loyalty through utility, ease of use and pleasure provided in the interaction with the product. So in other words, I guess UX design is the process of designing, whether that's a digital or physical products, we're only going to be talking about digital products today, that are really useful and easy to use, uh, delightful to interact with. Um, and it's about enhancing the experience that people have when interacting with your product or your service. And of course, making sure that they find value in that as well. Um, like I said, it's not a, um, not a comprehensive explanation. So for any serious UXs out there, please don't judge me. Um, so let's first of all go on to um, 
what's happening at the moment. So um, for any of you UXers out there, you're probably already aware that there's a huge transformational change in the industry. Part of that has been to do with the natural process over time, the ever evolving door of digital. Um, however, a lot of that has also been forced because of COVID as well. Um, so UX is now widely recognized as being essential to any successful business strategy. And the likes of Forbes have actually said that user experience is now actually your business strategy. So they're going hand in hand. It's no longer a nice to have. It's actually now a need to have. And we can probably all think of some brands that have hit the headlines over the past two, three years that have perhaps not adapted as well as possible um, and they've fallen on hard times and they've ended up being bought out by a, a UX digital champion like Sports Direct or Boohoo. Um, so it's more important than ever that we're actually linking our design metrics to our business metrics and the individuals now, so you guys, if you are UXers out there or designers or product owners, product managers, whatever you are, whoever you are, um, you're now actually more important than ever because you're now responsible for designing your software and that's now at the heart of your business's success. So it's more important than ever that we're doing that properly. Um, so times have changed and we need to adapt to, and it's actually quite nice uh, to see. So UX now has a, a, a seat at the C-suite table, which is exciting. Um, so why do we need to do UX research? And we kind of covered some of that in the slide before, and Kevin actually made some fantastic points from Brain Labs about some of the customers that he's been working with. Um, so just some kind of common sense points, really, about why we need to be doing these. And um, some of these, hopefully, you can take to C-suite as well if you need some more buy-in to democratise the UX as well. Um, so... We need to be building the right thing. So digital needs and preferences are changing rapidly. So we're here talking about the ever evolving door of digital. Um, we can't afford to get the big bets wrong anymore. And we definitely can't waste resources. So I've never met anyone involved in UX that said, Chloe, I've just got too much time and I've got too much budget. I've got too much resource. It just doesn't happen. So we need to be really calculated about what we're doing and where we're defining our time. Apologies, my dog has made an entrance. Um, so UX research delivers the data to determine whether your digital strategy is the right one. So kind of recapping on those points, and we've got some more here. Um, we've got little wiggle room, we can't afford to get it wrong. We're scared of building the wrong thing. We're wasting precious resources and we don't have the time to get it wrong. So if we're doing UX research, it's ensuring that our website and our experiences are designed and built using data-driven decisions. So not just on a whim or a hope or, or what our competitors are doing, because they might not have tested it either. And trust me, you'd be surprised actually at how many businesses don't test. And I actually see it more at the bigger end of the spectrum and the really enterprise type businesses who you think, oh yeah, they've got it really under control. They're not actually testing anything. And when they do, it makes all that difference. And 1% to them is obviously a huge amount. Um, got some fantastic case studies actually on the user Zoom website. There's one of them with H&M and how we increase conversion by 3%. So have a look over there after um, if you're interested. Um, but also as well, we can use UX research to identify issues before we begin development and we can reduce the cost and the reworks of the post-release challenges. So let's get it right the first time around. It's costing us more money if we've got to fix it later down the road. Um, and all of this ensures that we're building world-class digital experience. We're going to increase our customer loyalty. We're going to reduce the competitive pressure and we're going to drive growth. And some also some very relevant things are things like reduced um, strain on contact sentence as well over COVID. That's a, that's a big thing we've been working on. Um, so this is a horrible slide because it shows you how actually important it is because for every one dollar spent i'm sorry that it's in dollars i'm aware that we're in the uk but it doesn't quite translate as nicely if we put it in pounds um for every one dollar spent to resolve a problem during product design ten dollars would be spent on the same problem 
during development. And then horrifically, that then same problem would then cost us $100 or more if the problem had to be solved at the product's release. So identify problems early, fix them early. OK, so how can a good strategy increase revenue? How can we lower cost? Because ultimately, that's what we're all looking for. We're all looking to make more money and reduce our costs. So at the moment, we've got new needs, we've got new customers. And what does a good UX look like? So we all know, this shouldn't be a surprise, that good UX increases customer retention, it increases conversion and journey success. It, can increase, it increases our average order value, like Kevin touched on before with Brewdog. That's a fantastic example. Um, it also lowers support costs, documentation, training costs, support into cost centers. It lowers the cost of customer acquisition. It reduces development waste and resource strain. And ultimately, this is what we want to be doing. More revenue, less cost. Still to meet a business this day that's, uh, that's not asked me for those things. So... Let's have a look at how high performing organizations succeed. So there's been loads and loads of um, research done into this. Um, so Gartner, Envision, McKinsey have also for a while looked into the potential of UX and how these successful companies achieve it. So there's three key main points that we're going to run through today. And it's all about business results, over time, incremental growth gains leads to cost savings, more revenue. So number one, so we need to be able to continuously iterate. Number two, successful businesses bake research throughout the product development process so they can make confident decisions. And these decisions are based on data like we talked about in the previous slide. And three, they measure performance because they know that it's hard to manage what you can't measure. How can we measure something that we can't manage? We can't. So we need to be able to put a number on that. So these companies are measuring UX performance so they know the impact of releasing a new feature and how their UX is improving over time. And also, of course, how do they stack up against their competitors? So let's take a dive, deeper dive into these. So number one, Let's look at iteration and usability, okay? So to be able to do this, we need to be able to create a culture of research. And I meet a, a lot of businesses that um, they think that they can't do research because they don't have UX researchers or because they've never done it before or because they don't have budget. And actually, that's completely the wrong way around to look at it. You don't have to be a UX researcher to test UX. You don't have to have thousands and thousands of pounds to test it. And you don't need to be a UX brain like Kevin or myself or, or Leon to be able to do these things. Um, start small, test small, make improvements and create a culture of research um, and really democratize that research as well. So it's not just the person that's responsible for research doing research but it's your product managers it's your cmo it's whoever it is make everyone responsible for research so continuously test and validate to keep up with the pace of design and development um, expand quick tactical testing to designers product managers marketers um, like I said, there's really fast and easy ways for non-researchers non to find those friction points that are in your customer journey, and we can learn how to fix them quite simply. So whether it's a gradual change or a drastic change, um, continue to iterate, um, because the more we iterate, the better our CX is, essentially. Number two, baking um, research throughout the product development process um, so we can make confident decisions because we have the data to back it. 
And this can also be a big challenge as well that I see with our customers that perhaps UX is appreciated appreciated as a team but they might not be taken as seriously as they could be um we call them hippos which are high influencing you know high very senior people who it's my way or the highway it's black and white this is what i did at my previous company this is what our competitors doing well actually if we go to them with a full picture and say actually yeah you know i thought it was a great idea as well mr hippo but we've run a study on it and actually, we had a lot more task success with A than we did with B. What are your thoughts with that? Find us a seat at the table. Um, and we can be confident in our decisions. And if they still want to do it that way, then when it doesn't work, you can say, look, well, I did my job. Um, so it's really important that we're making user informed strate strategic decisions early on in the product development process. Um, so we need to be able to uncover our unmet needs of our customers um, and we need to be able to use these pain points to drive our innovation um, and also we can use this to prioritize um, our features as well um, you know a lot of customers that I speak to they have a lot of issues and they're like oh where do I start okay well let's start with the problem that's causing us the most money causing our customers the most pain um, and ultimately this will save us money as well um, so prototype test improve test improve launch okay so redesigning user interface in interfaces on the basis of testing substantially improves ux and it's de-risking the decision and again it comes back to saving us money and the risk of getting it wrong the cost of getting it wrong as well um so find a tool that suits your needs you don't have to spend thousand you know basic usability tests are absolutely fine and we'll come into some of those at the end as well i'm not going to have time to go through them per se but we can just give you a top kind of headline overview of of, of what are the kind of things that we can be doing at an entry mid-level as well. Um, number three, so they measure performance. Um, and I can't remember who said it, but someone said a great line to me once, and it said that um, great user experiences are invisible, so we need to be able to make them measurable. So measuring performance, because we know it's hard to manage what we can't measure, and we know our great experiences are really hard to measure, so we need to find a way to measure that. Um, so there's lots of ways to measure performance. And again, not all loads of them cost loads of money. So at user Zoom, we use something called the QX score, which combines like task success and attitudinal um, behavioral data to give us a score. And then we can also do the same for competitors and we can make small iterations and continue to grow and develop. You don't have to use user Zoom. You don't even have to um, have a tool. I know companies, a big company actually came to me yesterday, really big company, and they're using free tools, um, which really surprised me. But you know what? They're doing OK. They're a big company for a reason. So you don't need to spend loads of money. Um, benchmark ourselves. Benchmark our competitors. Where do we want to be? Where are we now? What are they doing? What are we doing? What friction points have we got? And create a roadmap where everyone has accountability to be able to move forwards. OK, so there's the three things. I'm just going to touch briefly on the test types that we can use to use these three things. So there's hundreds of test types out there, um, you know, and Kevin went into some of those before. Um, but here are some of the simple test types. Um, and these are unmoderated test types, which means that they are easier to run and typically quicker to run. You can run them yourself in-house, equally your agency can run them for you. Um, or you can use a platform like UserZoom. So UserZoom, we are a platform, but we also have participant sourcing as well. Um, so the basic usability test. So this is like a think out loud study. So this is essentially where we ask our customer to go through our website and we might ask them to, for example, um, add a bouquet of flowers to your basket that's under 20 pounds. They're going to be for Mother's Day um, and you want to write a gift message in there and say Happy Mother's Day. And we can watch them go through the website, see their struggles, see their friction. And at the same time, they're, they're speaking. So they're going, oh, I can't find the button for this. Or, oh, it's over there. So it gives us really good feedback. 
We can also do click testing as well. So we can observe where participants are clicking first. So we can measure first impressions. We can define success areas um, and visualize clicks within a heat map as well. So we can see where people are looking, where people are going to, where people are best placed. Um, card sorting. So ensure that our content is structured in a way that your users understand. So we're doing a lot of this um, at the moment with a company called Gusto, um, who are like a, a through the mail food delivery subscription service like a HelloFresh um, and tree testing as well. So assess the findability of your menu by, assure, by measuring where users expect. So you can ask your customers, um, you're vegetarian. Well, I'm vegetarian, you might not be vegetarian, but pretend you're vegetarian. Um, go and choose five vegetarian meals for the next week and we can watch them doing this and see where they expect them to be. And of course, doing surveys as well. So gather rich attitudinal feedback using advanced logic condition and randomization. So that's a really quick and intuitive way to understand what people's feelings. Um, live intercept as well. So a little bit more advanced. Um, and this is where you can intercept people that are going through your website and you can then ask them questions. Did you find what you were looking for today? And you can actually speak to them. And then you've got loads of advanced UX research methods as well. And of course, you've also got moderated, which I'm not even going to get into today, but that's when you are as the moderator or asking them questions and running it more like an interview. But today, that's all we really have um, time for. So I'm just going to wrap up into the, some of the key takeaways. This is actually a screenshot from the UserZoom website. So if, if you go into the UserZoom website, you can click on products and you can actually dive into these different tests, find out more about them, the advantages, the disadvantages, when we should be using them. Um, so I do encourage you to have a look at that to kind of dive into that further if you want to. And here are my key takeaways from today. So question big decisions. Don't be afraid to test. You do not have to be a UX researcher, an expert to test. You just don't. Disseminate your insights as well and de-risk decisions by being data-driven. Perfect. So I believe that Leon's actually going to do the question and answers at the end. So I would just like to say, um, Chloe Sinclair from UserZoom, thanks everyone for joining today. That's all we've got time for. That's it. Thank you very much for that, Chloe. Appreciate that. That's a super presentation. Uh, and I think that fits very, very neatly alongside the content that, that Kevin um, introduced to us. I'm going to invite Kevin to come back in for the, the Q&A now. So um, if you want to come back in, Kevin, we've, we've got a couple of questions uh, from, from our people today, from the from the guests. I'm going to point the first one at you, uh, Kevin, um, which one of our uh, guests has asked, investing in data isn't particularly tangible so if nobody is interested you know if there isn't that kind of boardroom stakeholder support for for, for data as which you're a, a massive advocate how do I make that case you know what does what does that look like I think I think the great thing about making this case for for, for making data-led decisions is that once you've got a little bit it starts to do it itself uh, you only need but one little snippet of one real little nugget of really interesting um, insight that can say, okay, this is this is not working. This is costing us money. As soon as you say, look, this is this is costing us money, we can see this is impacting conversion rate. That's when you can start to get people really interested. A really good example of that is um, we've been working with uh, one of our clients on some site speed stuff recently, and we've been talking about the site speed for ages. We've been, you know, everyone knew the site speed was was poor. It was never really about appetite. Everyone was like speaking about it, but there was never really about appetite to actually make anything happen. So we looked at um, what site speed was like with conversion rate. And as soon as we were able to see conversion rate, site speed is impacting our conversion rate. Conversion rate is going down. This is costing you money. As soon as you say this is costing you money, um, you'll 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 be surprised how quickly things get prioritised. So if you can find that one little nugget of something that's really interesting, but you can say this is costing money. When you can fix that and actually have a positive improvement, that starts, that can really start to um, kind of start a wave of that really. Once you've done that once, you can really start to prove that actually yeah, we're costing money, we fixed it, it made us more money, uh, and quickly the appetite to continue doing that um, starts to increase. Absolutely. I think, uh, Chloe, you mentioned uh, the concept of the, the hippo. Uh, in your in your talk there, and that's something that here at Door Four, and I know you are you're a, a follower of the, the the notion of the hippo 
Kevin, I think you might have even taught me the, the, the phrase several years ago. We we um, we have the acronym. Yeah, I think the that highest... was about you. I think you, you think you weren't a hippo at the time. <laughs> Ooh. I think that we 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 use the acronym the highest paid person in the office. I think to you know signify that the, the most senior person really often gets that gets asked their opinion on what things should be and how something should work, given that they've got maybe the most experience, seemingly. But I think that. You know, the data always trumps somebody's opinion, no matter how you know, solid and rooted in experience that opinion is. Would you Would you guys agree? Definitely. You can't take an opinion to a data fight. You just can't. I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> and so, Chloe, I suppose... <laughs> um, a lot of what we're talking about, the, the notion of, of user experience testing and the processes and methodologies and uh, approaches that we've talked about today, we know that in bigger retailers, in mature e-commerce and lead generation businesses, what we're talking about today is pretty much second nature. You know, the, the two of you, your clients get it, you live it, you breathe it. If, if we step back a little bit to maybe less mature businesses, some more nascent e-commerce startups and businesses that are in the first few years with maybe smaller teams how would would you recommend that a company that's not been doing testing begins that journey you know where, where would you recommend that they begin yeah exactly so um i would choose a tool that's um relatively inexpensive dip your toe in the water um, or go to your agency and seek advice from them start small get the results and then build from there. Like I said, you don't need to be an expert. You don't need to be a big business. In fact, there's actually a lot of evidence to show that mid-market businesses do more testing than the large enterprise businesses, which is interesting. Um, but I did read that. That is true. Um, you know, and things like the Think Out Loud studies are fantastic um, to understand what people are thinking about when they're going through your customer journey so you can go to your um, agencies and they can recruit participants for you I mean hey you can use people that you know friends family you know proof is in the pudding first of all um, and then scale it up you know then you can start thinking about more advanced usability tests um, even surveys you know place a bot on your website ask how their experience was today did they find what they were looking for how easy was the navigation um, and scale it from there there's loads and loads and loads of um, uh, information blogs case studies on the user zoom resources um, section about how we've done that with customers and step one through to step 10 so have a look at those as well superb thank you thank you chloe um kevin one one thing that's caused a a, a bit of a, a, a stir a positive stir in the comments you mentioned the, the site speed and conversions i think site speed is is often my experience is one of the things that many website owners take for granted they assume that the speed is a speed i think like you've rightly pointed out that 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 speed we've, we've seen studies that that start speed every fractional marginal increase you make you you make can de potentially deliver increases in conversion because of a better quicker smooth experience with less friction you know can you just give us a bit of an insight into how you would test start speed against conversion yeah so there's a, there's, there's two ways really there's a there's a simple but costly bit way or there's a complex but um kind of more integrated way so um the simple way is there's, there's services we can help us do that um one of the services i've used that can do that is is speed curve uh, but there are other services like that that can essentially um they've just got two parts there's one is the kind of lab testing so we're going to a, a, a test on your, on your site speed every day but also you can uh, feed that into your website and set what a what a conversion is or what a, a sale is uh, and that will then over time actually start to, to do that calculation for you and start to tie speed performance back to conversion rate um how we've done it here um we integrated with so google have got a a, a library um a core web vitals library that you can plug into a website which can um essentially um bring these date these speed metrics out uh, in JavaScript, and then we can then write a little script which feeds that into Google Analytics. 
Um, so that's a little bit more manual, needs a little bit more technical uh, know-how to pull that together, but it means that we can then feed that data directly into our into our Google Analytics. And what's really interesting from that is we can really start to get some, not just because we, I think people are becoming more interested in site speed mostly because Google's telling them to. Um, Google's saying, if you don't improve your, improve your site speed, and this is, this is going to happen, et cetera. Um, by looking at how it actually impacts your users, you can really start to make some more more qualified decisions. So rather than just saying, okay, let, let's make the site, the, the site quicker, um, a really good example of that is for one of our clients, which we've done this with, um, we can see that site speed was generally kind of um, even between most pages, but actually it was when the site speed was poor on the PDPs and the product pages, that impacted the conversion more. So that's where we focus our efforts. Rather than just saying, oh, let's just improve site, site speed everywhere, we can see it impact conversion most on product pages, so let's, in, uh, let's fix it there as well. Um, most importantly, another side of it is is one of the big things that people, Google have been talking a lot about is kind of um, cumulative layout shift, which is one of their, their new metrics that they've they've come up with, and it's been getting a lot of people quite worried um, about how it impacts conversion and SEO. Actually, for most of the clients we've worked with, that's the metric that has the least impact on conversion. So obviously, we don't want to ignore it because it is a part of Google's search algorithm, but um, in terms of when we're seeing this data, we can start to um, prioritize which speed metrics we might want to prioritize based on what the what, how it's going to impact our revenue and our conversion rate um, so by tying it in that way rather than just looking at a scientific level at the top we can make those more informed decisions but yeah the services such as speed curve which can help us get a foot in the door quite quickly um, or there are more technical ways to um, if you to integrate it with our analytics if you've got that bit of tech know-how fantastic thank you thanks kevin so I think that probably brings us to the end of the q and I'm going to put you both on the spot and I'm going to both ask you to give our audience one final tip just to add to the great presentations you've already done. So go on and put you, you on the spot first, Kevin. One final tip for our, for our audience. Yeah, I, think, I think it is just about being inquisitive. It's about always trying to wonder why something's happening, not just accepting this has changed, let's react. It's this has changed, why is that? It's really... Everything, Anything that happens throughout the day, you can ask a question and you can probably find um, find something for you to really get, stu you get stuck into. So just trying to be as inquisitive as possible and empowering other people to be inquisitive as well. Super. I love the power of why. Absolutely love it. And, and Chloe, have you, have you got a final uh, snippet just to leave our audience with? Uh, yeah, I would say that Rome wasn't built in a day. Um, I love the philosophy of Kaizen, which is making incremental changes to continually better things. So sometimes not taking on too much at once, but standing up for one thing, test that thing, change that thing, and you know, really champion that and and don't be uh, put off by hippos and opinions, you know, really champion that and uh, and Kaizen it. Love it. Guys, then it will we'll bear that one in mind. And you mentioned, Chloe, you've got some swag for some lucky people. What we'll do, we'll, um, we'll, we'll put a link to your, your the two of your profiles on the Door 4 LinkedIn page after this event. Uh, and hopefully anybody that wants to connect with you can do. So that brings us to the end of our form, formal proceedings. I'd really like to thank Chloe Sinclair and Kevin Robinson for being a part of Decoding Digital today. Two excellent speakers. Hopefully it's been a good use of an hour of your time this morning. Uh, the recording will be available from the Door 4 website by, uh, by Monday morning. So if you're watching this on the recording, then don't get an infinite loop around that. Um, the next event is on Friday, the 25th of February. Uh, more details will be available on the Door 4 website very, very shortly. Uh, and with that, I'd just like to thank uh, everybody for joining us and see you next time. <laughs>